Part 3, Tutorial 25. Here we are with our diagram, exactly where we left it in terms of a public machine, a private machine, the switches, etc. Um, what we want to cover now is baselining our actual Viata machines. We've created them, they're a vanilla install of the operating system, so that means you can log in, as I am here, as VYOS. And we can do a show interfaces, and they're all down at the moment. And they're all down because we haven't connected anything. So that's fine. There is no wires, um, albeit virtual wires, between the switches and the routers. So the interfaces are not seeing anything. I'm going to log in on the south side as well. I'll talk about these as the north side and the south side. So router LAN01 on the north side and router LAN02 on the south side. We'll ignore effectively Paris for the moment, but that's fine. Um, we don't need to get Paris done just yet, and we may well cover that right at the very end. Um, just going to do a show interfaces on the south side machine on router LAN02. Four interfaces, that's what we wanted to see. No config whatsoever. So what do we want to do first? Well, in terms of hardening up the machine, go into config mode on router LAN01, and we want to set up our user, I guess, would be the first thing. Why are we setting up a user? We've got VYOS. Well, you would certainly want to change the password of VYOS and you, you could do that. That'd be fine. That would harden the machine up from the point of view of SSHing in when you do get one on software. Um, you can SSH in and the standard username is Viata. But that creates an attack trajectory because the default username is well known to um, potential hackers, etc. Um, so maybe good advice is step one is to get onto your machine and actually create a username that will be the admin user and remove the default admin user. So that's what we're going to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is set system, uh, login, user, and we're going to call it Zeus. I'm going to have a Greek, a Greek god thing going on for this particular tutorial. Uh, the authentication is going to be a plain text password and I'm going to make that Greek gods. We also want to say that this user is going to be set system login user Zeus. What are they going to be? Are they going to be a user standard level or are they going to be an admin? Well, for our purposes, we want this user to have level admin. So we're going to give them level admin. We're going to commit that and then we're going to save that. And we're going to do exactly the same down here. So we're going to go into config mode. We're going to set system uh, login user use authentication plain text pass. Oh, if I could spell login user use authentication plain text password same password Greek gods. We're going to set system login users use and level is going to be admin and we're going to commit that and we're going to save that so what can we do now well i can exit and exit i can exit whoops and exit and once i'm back at the login screen we can log in as zeus and make sure that this is working before we remove the other one or else we'll lock ourselves out of the machine we can get to config mode on the north side um, we will do exactly the same now on the south side. And can we get to config mode? We can. So the next thing we want to do is we want to del delete system login user vyos. Get rid of it. Commit that. Save that. Exit out of here. Whoops. And exit out again. We'll do exactly the same down here. Delete system, login, user, VYOS. Commit that, save that, exit out of here, and exit out again. And this is real baseline level stuff, but now try and log in as VYOS with VYOS as a password. And you can't get in. And that's absolutely fine. That's what we expected, but we can get in as Zeus with our password and we can get to config mode. Perfect. 
So we've hardened up the machines, if you like, level one hardening or level zero, to be honest. We've gotten rid of a potential trajectory for people to come at our machine on the public interface. There's other things we want to do, of course, but that's, that's the first level of making this sound. So what's the next? What's next? What do we want to do next? Well, after we've created our user and hardened up, like I said, level zero, got the base thing done, we want to actually set our host now. So to do that, from config mode, set system, host name, whoops, host name, um, we want to call this one RTR LAN01. Perfect. This one down here on the south side, we want to set system, host name, uh, RTR, sorry, LAN02. So we have our host name set up. We also want to set the time zone. So I'll stay on the south side here. Actually, no, I'll stick with my format and do it on the north side. Set system time zone. To get an actual list of the time zones, you can have hit tab and it will show you what they are. So we can then type Europe. Whoops. And I always have this. I can't really understand what they want to do, what they want me to type in, because I type Europe and they, you know. No, it's just not having it. So I'll do a control C or space, sorry, just to get out of there. Europe. And then you hit tab, but this one actually allows me to do stuff. So I can type in London. <laughs> go figure. Um, but once you've done it the once, you, you know that you just go set system time zone and Europe slash London. So at least we're on the same time zone. That's fine. On Back on the north side again, the next thing we want to do is probably set the domain name. So it's set system domain name. I'm going to stick with my sassify.com. Down on the south side, set system, whoops, system domain name. I'm definitely suffering with type ISIS again. And we'll go sassify.com as well. Good. So we've got a host name, we've got a domain name, and we've got a time zone set up. The next thing to set up is probably to remove another security risk which revolves around SSH. Everyone in the world knows SSH is port 22, TCP port 22. So it presents an opportunity for people to attack your machine on port 22, whether that's a denial of service attack or some sort of flooding. But they know, they know that, you know, a bit like the default username, everybody knows it's VYOS, VYOS. Everybody knows it's Viata um, when it's set up within one of the cloud providers. Remove those possible attack vectors for people. So to do this, we want to reset our SSH to be on a different port. So first of all, we want to know that the service SSH is running. Now you wouldn't have been able to SSH in. I'm on a console here because we're in my lab. But if you'd have gone to your software Viata, you'd have SSH'd in. So you know the service is running, but I'm covering everything for our lab here. So set the service up, make sure it's there. Then set the service, um, set service, SSH, and we're gonna run it on port 22272. Why not? Just choose a random port to run the service on. I'm gonna commit all of those changes and I'm gonna save them. And I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna do exactly the same. Set uh, service, SSH, whoops, to get it up, set service, SSH, port 22272. I'm going to commit everything on the south side, and I'm going to save that as well. So that's good. So what have we done? We've done our user, our host name, our domain name, our time zone, and our SSH service. So that's good. We're in a position where the most rudimentary things have been set up across these two systems. So what do we want to do? Well, at this stage now, we have our 
as we've just been through our host name, our username, our domain name, etc. Um, and we've reset the port for SSH. So the next thing to do on this machine is going to be setting up some of the baseline elements of the actual system itself. So what we want to do is enable or make sure they're enabled. By default, certain things will come through. And we can look at what's come through from a default configuration by having a look at more slash config slash config dot boot, which is the configuration file. And we can see we've got our Ethernet with our hardware addresses, our service is on port, our for SSH is on port 22272, and that is pretty much it. It's got an NTP servers, syslog, time zone is what we want, but nothing much is set up on this machine because it's a default configuration. So we want to enable some of the things that we want to have set up. So what are some of these things? Well, first up is to think about the firewall itself, because this machine will be acting as our firewall, and actually enable uh, all ping. So what is all ping? Well, you know, reconnaissance when you're building out your network is very, very handy. And being able to ping IP addresses and ping machines is something that we all would like the ability to do. We don't want to do, you know, or enable a capability that allows um, what they call broadcast pings, but we do want to have the ability to ping this machine. So we're going to say in our actual um, configuration, we're going to set our firewall such that all ping is an enable. Now, as I mentioned, the next thing to do is set the firewall so that broadcast ping, and broadcast ping provides the ability for people to ping the entire subnet so that they can see what's on the subnet. So we want to turn broadcast ping off. So we're going to disable it. Okay, that's those two. On redirect, redirects are interesting because Redirects for both IPv6 and IPv4, these options should be disabled by default, but again, we're covering doing everything by hand here. So we're gonna hand crank the fact that we're gonna, when we receive redirects, we're gonna disable this. We're not gonna allow it. And we're not gonna allow it because, you know, ICMP redirects uh, can be used or could be used, you know, um, for denial of service attacks. So we're actually going to turn those off. We're actually going to say we're not going to allow um, IPv6 or IPv4 redirects because we don't want to get this machine, um, we don't want to have this machine um, potentially attacked on a denial of service basis. So to do that, what we're going to do again, set firewall, bring that command up. We're going to say IPv6, re receive redirects, and we're going to disable it. To do it for IPv4, we just say receive redirects, and we're going to disable that as well. The next one is source route. So by default, again, IPv6 and IPv4 source route are both disabled, or they should be disabled. This means that um, our Viata here will drop IPv4 and IPv6 packets that contain um, source root information in the header. And again, if this is allowed, then it, the machine will process the IP header root information and it could override the routes that we put on this machine. And we don't want to have that. We don't want to allow that. So we're going to set firewall, I might as well bring this up, and we're going to say that IPv6 SRC root, and we're going to disable it. And we're going to do exactly the same for IPv4. Oops, SRC, ah, this one is IP SRC. <laughs> yep, and we're going to disable that. I've forgotten what it was. Um, okay, good. Okay, so what do we need to do next? Well, 
Next, we now need to deal with the last few baselining items. So the first one is uh, quite an odd sounding one, logging Martians. So logging Martians became the term to be associated with when you log or you generate a log entry, um, when you your router receives a, me a message or a packet that has come from an invalid source or destination address and it will log these and it will say you know I had these sort of strange looking packets um, so by default it's enabled but we want to make sure it is so we're going to go back in again we're going to set firewall and we're going to say that log martians is enabled so we're going to enable that one the next one is sending redirects so this differs from receiving redirects that we dealt with earlier and source routes this is about sending redirects so it means that the router will redirect uh, ICMP type 5 messages to directly connected hosts but only under certain conditions so it will send them when the packet received and being and is being routed at the same interface and the source address of the packet is in the same subnet so under those conditions, it will actually send the redirect. So we're going to set firewall. Whoops, if I could spell again. And we're going to say send redirects. And we're going to enable it. Next one is source validation. So source validation, again, this option should be disabled by default. But what does it do? Well. The purpose of source validation uh, relates to reverse path filtering, which in turn is the process of validating whether or not uh, the source address of a packet is expected on the interface that it arrived on. So is it expected? Did we expect this? So source validation is disabled, so we're going to make sure that it is. So we're going to set firewall, source validation, disabled. Good. There's only a couple more of these. Next up is SYN cookies. So you can actually get flooded or your router can get flooded by an attacker using TCP SYN uh, packets. So what you want to do is stop what they call SYN flooding and decrease the likelihood that your TCP queue will get over... Con will get, um, overloaded and you do this by actually enabling uh, SYN cookies so that we will keep a cookie around these things. So we want to set firewall, we want to say SYN cookies and we want to enable it. Should have been enabled by default but we're just making sure this is baselining our actual router configuration, our firewall configuration. So Last up is config trap and by default this is disabled and this means that our router will not log configuration changes. So we want to log configuration changes because it's best practice to do so. So we're going to say set firewall config trap and we're going to enable that particular option. So I'm going to commit all of this, I'm going to save all of that, and I'm going to pop down to our other machine. And I'm going to do exactly the same again. So on our secondary machine, we're going to set firewall. We'll just run through these again. Set firewall, all ping. And we're going to, whoops, enable all ping. We're going to, whoops, disable. For broadcast ping, we're going to disable it, just like we did above. For firewall, IPv6, receive redirects, we're going to disable it. For IPv4, receive redirects, we're going to disable that one as well. We're then going to have IPv6 SRC root. We're going to 
disable this. We're going to do the same for IP. So V4 source root is disabled. Then we're going to log Martians enable. Send redirects under those certain conditions. We're going to enable. Source validation. We're going to disable. Almost there. Sin cookies. We're going to enable. And config trap. To get our configuration changes, we are going to enable. And we're going to commit that and save it. So we've got a baseline now. We have our firewall router set up in the way, well, both of them in this, in this uh, situation, set up in the way that we've baselined them. So we've done the host, the time zone, uh, the SSH. We've hardened it up in terms of some firewall rules, general baseline default settings that we want to set. So we're now going to move on to a couple of the other baseline things, which are going to be relating to the filtering and the global state policy. So I guess I'll deal with that in terms of global state policies first. So we want our router generally, our firewall, to be stateful and to have statefulness. And what does this mean? Well, this means that once you've established a connection, that related connections, you're going to allow them. So we want to set that up and we could set it up by interface um, and do it within each firewall rule, but it's probably easier to actually set certain things up to be global values that are recognized across every firewall. Now you can override them. So I do want to make, um, make it clear that you can override these global state policies within specific interface firewall rules. So it's no downside to set these at the global level and then to override them if, if you should choose to do so. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to set firewall and we're going to say that the state policy for established connections, the action is to accept it. Make sense? Establish connection, accept it. We're also going to say that related, so if it's related to an established connection, the action there would be accept, or the default action, the policy. Um, the next thing we want to do is think about the memory size on this machine and well this set of machines and the way in which memory is being used. So Viata VYOS is ostensibly using NetFilter which is part of Unix and NetFilter is using connection tracking to track our connections and to enable the packet filtering capability uh, to allow firewalls to work and more on that in just a second. So one of the tables that we're going to have is an ARP table and the ARP table is address resolution protocol and this will allow us to do Ethernet to IP address resolution. That table depending on how many connections, now obviously in our lab here we'll have nowhere near the amount of connections that are going to override the amount of memory that we set up on these 256 meg in a real software environment, you're probably going to have four to eight gig of memory. So you'll be swimming in memory. And there's no, no real reason why you shouldn't increase the default sizes of some of these tables. And in particular, this first one is going to be the ARP table. So I'm going to set the system IP ARP. And I'm going to say the table size. And I'm going to up it. So I'm going to up it. Um, I'm trying to remember what it has by default. Um, I can't actually remember off the top of my head. I think it's like 8024, but we're going to up it to 32768. And that's what we're going to set it at. So I'm going to commit that and I'm going to save that again as well before moving on to connection tracking. I'm going to do the same down here, just like we have been doing. Set firewall, state, policy, established action, 
except state policy related action accept and then far finally we're going to set the system ip arp table size 32768 commit save lovely okay so we baselined ourselves so far the next topic is to deal with the filtering itself and I've mentioned it just now. So, so what is NetFilter? Well, it's part of Linux that delivers all of the network functionality and capability. And to really understand NetFilter, you're gonna have to go to netfilter.org or the Wikipedia on NetFilter um, and the documentation on netfilter.org. But it's, you know, I couldn't possibly do it justice. It's an, uh, it's an enormous subject area within Linux. Um, contract. In order to establish uh, the capabilities to deliver a stateful firewall, and you'll remember the state policy we just set above here, and is still on the page, it requires um, statefulness. So statefulness requires connection tracking, and contract, C-O-N-N-T-R-A-C-K, is what NetFilter uses to do connection tracking. So, that's what Contract is, and Contract uses a whole load of tables and provides a whole load of helper modules that will allow um, that will allow you to do uh, statefulness and the capability to packet filter in the way that you want for your router uh, and firewall. So those tables, well, the baselines on Contract. Um, are things like the expect table size and the expect table is used to store expected or related connections so it, it keeps a table of these things and uses up a bit of memory and the default for that one is 2048 um, but we probably want to opt that again you know these things were set in a day when memory was really really hyper expensive and you know using less memory was a good thing whereas now well we've got plenty of memory so we, we can up these table sizes there's also the overall contract table size itself um which is set at 262144 by default and we can up that to a meg uh, without any problem at all and the hash size which is a lookup table used to manage actions um and contract uses that contract uses that is set at 4096, which uh, in today's network world is quite low. Um, so best practice uh, from looking at the literature is to increase that to 131070. So we're going to do that now, and then we're also going to turn off the helpful modules, which do use up uh, some memory and our process overhead that we don't really need because we won't be using those help modules. So. How do we do all of that within our contract? Um, sounds like a whole lot of work. It's just about eight commands that you just want to issue to baseline our actual router. So we want to set system contract and the expect table size, and we're going to make this 8192. Next one we're going to do is do the overall table size, as I mentioned, and we're going to make that 148567. The hash size, we're going to make that 131070 for our lookup table. And here are some of the modules. So, for instance, uh, modules FTP, we're going to disable it. Modules uh, GRE, we're going to disable it. H323, we're going to disable it. NFS, we'll be doing any of this, we're going to disable it. PPTP, disable that one. Um, next up is SIP, we're going to disable that. Again, if you have a need for these modules, by all means, enable them. And at least you've seen the video and what these things are. Literature, like I said, there's plenty of it out there in terms of what all these modules do in much greater detail than we can go into here. 
I'm just baselining this machine so that we get to a certain known state before we start doing um, our actual configuration work. I'm going to disable that one. Commit, save, and the hash table won't take effect until the next time the machine's rebooted. Let's do the same down here. Um, so I just want to check, um, yeah, IPR table. So we're starting from exactly the same point. We're going to do set system contract and the expect table size 8192. Just keeping these machines in lockstep all the time. The table size is going to be 104, um, 8, 5, 6, 7. How did I get to these sizes? Well, looking at all the literature online and reading up, these seem to be the ones recommended most across a plethora of input information that I went through. Um, and certainly when I've been using these things and doing this, I haven't come across any problems um, so far. I'm sure these things will change over time as I get used to as well, new things on uh, Viata machines. Just getting this all up to date in lockstep with the other machine. Finally, TF, whoops, TP. Excellent. Save. Probably a good time to do a, um, a power off on these two machines and just get them rebooted with our new table size. So join me in a second when we dive in to add the final few um, elements to our baseline configuration. Okay, so we've been through an awful lot of stuff. They're back up and running the two machines now with their new expect table sizes um, and their new hash table sizes. So we've baselined it so far. There's three things that remain. Um, one is NTP, the next one is our gateway, the default gateway for the machine, and then finally our DNS servers. Um, so I'm gonna emulate this in the lab as if it was software. So I'm gonna dive in on our machines. I'll just get onto this one while I'm at it as well. <clears throat> Go into config mode on both machines and our NTP server. So in software, and like I say, th this ain't gonna work for our machine here, but I'll show you the software command because it won't really affect anything we're doing. I'm gonna say set NTP server and in software, it's time.service.networklayer.com. That's what you would run. And that sets your time service. Whoops. Oh, done that the wrong way around. Set system. System, NTP, server, time. Yeah. Okay. That sets your time service to the back end um, time services. Now obviously that's a DNS address, so that cries out then for what are our name servers. So we're going to set system because it won't be able to resolve that uh, time, um, that actual time service network layer.com unless you have a DNS service. So again, within, and this won't work on my system here, I won't be able to resolve using what I'm about to put in. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, it's good for you to see these. You would then uh, set the system name server and the name server is on 10.0.80.11 and the secondary one is on 12. Okay, so now you have your DNS and you have your time, you can then add your default gateway. So how do you find your default gateway? Well, again, if you're stripping away a machine and starting again from scratch on software, you would look up your IP subnet. And in your IP subnet information, you'll have something like this. 
We saw it earlier on, um, and I think I left an error in here. My apologies if I did. I had some of these on 27s and 28s. We're going to keep them all the same. So you will find information about your VLAN, and you'll then go to your subnet, and within your subnet, it will tell you your gateway for the actual subnet. So in our case, it's 159, 10, 12, 97, 26. And then there's two reserved addresses for HSRP, or in our case, VRRP. So that's what we'll be using when we come to our VRRP. Um, I'll put that away. We know it's 97 that we want to be on. So we want to set system. Our final piece of the puzzle, gateway address, and we're going to have that on 159.10.12.97, and it's on a 26. Oops. 97, sorry. <laughs> we don't need to give it the subnet. So that's what we want to have it on. That is our um, actual gateway. So we're going to commit that. Give that a second. It's trying to find our gateway. And it's restarting our NTP service. And we want to save this. Good. I'm going to do the, exactly the same down here. So what are we going to set? Well, we're going to set system. Um, we're going to have the, what order did I do them in? It doesn't really matter. We can have name server first. Name server 10.0.80.11. Eighty dot one two. We want to set the actual uh, time on the system, so we want to set system NTP server time dot service dot network layer dot com, and then finally we want to set our system gateway address as 159.10.12.97. Commit those and save. Again, it's going to restart the daemon. It's not going to find our actual service because we're on our lab, but that's fine. Okay, good. So our baselining is finished. We're now going to move to the next phase of this, which is actually Having baselined these systems, we're now going to go ahead and create bonds. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to get these switches configured so that we've actually got an Ethernet Layer 2 network going on here that we can actually see systems. Because if I do a... I'll exit out of here for now and I do show interfaces. And I do an exit and show interfaces. We got nothing going on at the moment. In fact, when L is showing Ds, it means there's nothing connected. There's, there's no electricity running through this baby. So we want to actually get all of our cabling done as if we were physically cabling these things up in our lab here. We're going to do it virtually. We're going to connect these things. And then we should see all ops and we're good to go to start creating some bonding. Join me in a second. Okay, so we're still on part three, and um, part three is going to be rather a long part, but hey ho, we're going to cable these things up. So let's go to our cabling. So back on GNS3, I'm going to click on this little icon here, add a link, see? And we're going to go from Ethernet 0, that's on the public, and we're going to go out to interface 1 there. We're going to go from Ethernet 2, and we're going to go to this one, but we're going to go to port 8. So it's a dual link. On this one, we're going to go Ethernet 0 to port 2, and Ethernet 2 to port 7. So again, dual links on that side. Let's do this side. Port 1 to port 1. Port 3 to port 8. Port 1 to port 2 and port 3 to port 7. Now, highly likely in a real configuration, each of these Ethernet interfaces 
and cables would be going to two different switches. I'm just keeping it simple for now. I don't want to have to do a whole load of switching links. So I'm just showing a, in quotes, switch network through the switch out here. Same on this side as well. You would probably have two, three, you know, more uh, switches out here, uh, core and edge ones, and, and it would be configured in a specific way. Then I'm going to, well, basically I might as well connect these machines now. I'm going to connect that one into port 3, and I'm going to connect our private machine into port 3 as well. Okay, that's it for our cabling. Now what's that done to our actual interfaces in here? Oh looky, we have ops. So our interfaces are op. They're op and alive. Now I did a little diagram before of our actual what we're going to be doing here. And I think this is the diagram. Let's see if it is. It is. So what we're going to do now is we're going to bond our interfaces. And the reason I did both port 0 and 2 connected to that same switch and port 1 and 3 connected to the same switch. So remember, I went 0 and 2 connected to this switch on the public side and 1 and 3 connected to this switch on the private side. And I did the same down on LAN 02. And the reason I did that is we want to bond our interfaces. So we're going to use two physical Ethernet interfaces, but present one IP address on them to the outside world. So that's what we're going to be doing. 